Jane Moore and Carolyn, the owners of the store, for hosting the author events. And I want to thank all of you for showing up this afternoon. We're glad to have you here. And of course, we have a special author with us this evening, Wayfarer, Mary Ann Delaney. She'll be signing and discussing her latest book, Wayfaring Traveler, Earth Whisperers. This is the third book in the Wayfaring Traveler series. This is her book of organic farm stories and recipes. A holistic, nutritional, and herbal specialist, she ran a 70-acre organic farm in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia for 10 years. Friends who loved the farm called it Magic Valley, curving into another world of bright water, trout streams, rich bottom land, flower meadows, and woodland, their fragrance rising to meet you. She's still planting, and we're lucky that she now resides here near Taos. Would you please help me give a warm welcome to Mary Ann Delaney Wayfarer. <laughs> helicopter spraying Vietnam era stuff. Uh, so I ended up eventually having to sell the farm. But the interim was rich. It was grand. And I was mentored by my old timey neighbors in Appalachia. Um, and boy, could they tell a story. And some of them are in here. Um, I planted flowers and fruit trees and had honeybees and herbs and stuff for the beehives. And eventually I had animals, I had chickens. I grew field corn for them and they got scraps, of course. But then I had more animals than seemed humanly possible and it was pretty close to the truth. Um, I had cattle and sheep and goats and more chickens. And then I had a lot of uninvited animals Two skunks and raccoons and groundhogs. And that's our first story. It's groundhogs or me. As my neighbor Harlan's tractor cranked up at dawn, I seemed to hear fading into the nautilus shell brightness of dream. Wall up the burrow with stones and ask them to leave. Ask who to do what? I rolled out of the cot where I still camped out as I did the first plantings at the farm. I'd gone to sleep indignant and flummoxed. Two weeks before, <laughs> I'd found fresh dirt kicked out in a heap at the top of the garden. The beginnings of a subterranean groundhog living space. I called Bear, my dog, and pointed meaningfully at the opening. Puppy eager, he made excited <laughs> snuffles and danced around the entrance as if inviting me to play. Didn't get it. Butterflies were still as wondrous to him as squirrels and crickets. He didn't grasp his role yet in dealing with varmints who were bellying up to the banquet I'd laid out in the garden. I glared at the hole in the ground and embarrassed myself by bellowing down, Go away! <laughs> Liking the garden, they settled in. Out in the meadow, they had plenty of clover, white and rosy red. But in the cultivated ground, they had organically grown beans and peas. Very tasty. The groundhogs sported snub noses, buck teeth, and increasingly pudgy middles. Uh, it was war, but down in cool burrows, digesting, they lay unruffled. 
<clears throat> I'd see them waddle out to snack and would chase them up the side of the garden past the herb border, waving a stick. They just dropped out of sight, biding their time. I'd ask Mrs. Marshall, who was my old lady mentor, up at the country store what to do, as groundhogs were everywhere and prosperous. Uh, <laughs> she told me what she'd done that very week next to her garden, a an old widow woman who couldn't get around very well. And, well, she needed a fast solution. You just pour some gasoline down that hole and they'll die. Best thing, pesky critters, it'll show them who's boss. She was to mentor me in many old-timey skills, but I edged away from this modern one. Bear, my dog, would eventually dine on Groundhog, but not yet, not this puppy season. Feeling a little foolish but not wanting to use gasoline, <laughs> I did wall up the groundhog burrow, the garden entrance, as the voice in the dream had seemed to suggest. Speaking reasonably, first checking to see no one was eavesdropping, I asked all their friends and relations um, uh, to leave by one of their other tunnels. I now talked about how sweet and good the clover in the meadow would be and how abundant. It was above the orchard to be, under a blackberry thicket, that they sighted and dug in their new home. My dog eventually grew into his job description and took it seriously. But in the interim, the groundhogs let the garden be. Ebbed finally into rain, I was up visiting Ms. Marshall. At her country store, she pulled out a dusty gallon jar, unscrewed the galvanized lid, and reached a broad fist in. She was not dainty. Uh, <laughs> and drew out roundish red brown seed. And she put some in my hand. Know what them are? I didn't. Them are sugar drip that make the best sorghum molasses. You ever taste sorghum? Uh, yes, ma'am, I have in Texas. Now, before Lucas died, we did molasses boilings every year. She paused, looked out at the rain falling soft. It was early spring. She had a little fire going in the wood stove. I fed it a couple branches and settled back in my chair to listen. I've been a saving the seed, she said, kind of quiet. I'm a thinking you could grow some. I'd show you how to make molasses and do it right. Nestor and Bo would help you cut the cane. She told me how to plant the seed and tend the mountain adapted sugar cane. As it shot up tall, I planted quite a bit. The whole process of making molasses turned out to be the hardest, heaviest work I have ever done in my life. And some of the most satisfying. The cane grows up sort of like rows of, of bamboo or skimpy corn till it stands eight or 10 feet high and the stalks grow heavy with juice. After I'd chopped out weeds through the summer and we'd had a few light frosts and big copper pots of apple butter were simmering over outdoor wood fires up at Mrs. Marshall's. I heard Nestor and Bo chug along up front on the John Deere. I climbed onto the flat bed wagon and we headed on up the hill at dawn. We had curved bladed knives, homemade, led into wood handles at right angles. We pulled on heavy gloves and each took a row reaching up to the top. And uh, mind you, these things are tall. Reaching up to the top, 
of each stalk stripping the leaves and they ooze juice all over you. I, I learned all kinds of interesting stuff once this operation started. Um, bending down till we had stripped it clean, then curling the free arm around several bare stalks and giving a sharp pull and slice with the knife at the base of each. I stood up with my first bundle and staggered trying to tilt it horizontal. It was heavy beyond belief unwieldy, and I, I had made a two and a half foot progress down a row hundreds of feet long. Uh, Bo, who was a burly and kindly man, grinned <laughs> at my panicked surveying of the plot, said not to grab hold of so many at a time, and I'd do just fine. We heaped stalks onto the wagon till we had enough to make a squeezing. I stood on one running board of the tractor, and Nestor, Bo's daddy, stood on the other. Uh, all of us sticky with juice, and we headed up the hill to the country store. Ms. Marshall already had the fire started, uh, a long one of old fence posts in a sort of barbecue pit um, <laughs> that was built to hold the molasses pan, which we'd drop in when the juice was squoze. The pan measured about, about a foot deep, maybe two and a half foot wide, and seven in length. There was a chimney at one end and a little roof. Bo left the wagon by a big freestanding tin roof on old Southling uprights, and he drove the tractor in and hooked up the power takeoff to a rusty behemoth of a molasses press that Lucas had devised. He had been a wizard of a tinkerer, uh, famous in those parts for his balers and threshers and handy widgets. He had blacksmithed big gears, rigged pulleys and heavy rollers that were grooved lengthwise with a wide feed. Bo started it up and made fine adjustments while it <coughs> clanked and clattered and Miss Marshall looked on. <laughs> well satisfied to see it up and running again. Way up in her 70s, by the time she mentored me, she sat in a ladder-back chair, resting her bad leg, and did her gap-tooth laugh. <laughs> and beamed. Nestor and Bo and I grabbed armsfuls of the cane and fed the stalks butt-end into the press. A frothy green juice came gushing out, funneling into big old milk cans. As each filled, Bo would grab the handles, <coughs> roll it aside, and slide in another. Now, there were plenty of milk cans um, for us to use from the days before big dairy interest destroyed the small producers. That's kind of a prequel to <laughs> the world now. Uh, when most everyone had milk cows and cooled down the rich milk of Jersey, Guernsey, and Brown Swiss, setting the galvanized cans into springhouse troughs of flowing, frigid water. That's how they chilled the milk. Before dawn, full milk cans were collected by the local uh, cooperative, the creamery, uh, and clean empties left off. Big money interests lobbied for legislation demanding stainless steel milk cooling tanks on each farm. Mm. Small farms couldn't afford them pretty simple. Uh, and few even had electric to the barns. It was a pretty much foregone conclusion once they won that legislative battle. The families did hand milking by lantern light, most of them. Harlan was hurt least. He was my, my nearest neighbor who cranked up the tractor. <coughs> uh, he raised shorthorns, uh, which was an old Scottish breed, and they were good for both milk and, and beef. So he started raising up beef steers instead. And Eula, his wife, my good friend, didn't have to get up at four in the morning to milk anymore. <laughs> but the legislation destroyed livelihoods on many subsistence family farms. Young folks began leaving for factory jobs in the cities, and now we get watery commercial high production Holstein milk. 
Bo scooped out a taste of sorghum juice, kind of greenish, for me in a white coffee mug without its handle. Said not to drink too much. Could give me the runs. <laughs> it was sweet with a green tang to it, and it tasted full of nourishment. The old family doctor in those parts used to prescribe sorghum. It, t it being B vitamin and mineral rich for the low blood. <laughs> now we call it anemia. <laughs> um, when the kids did begin leaving the farms to find work, the old folks kept on making the daily bites in a mason jar of sorghum molasses till they couldn't anymore. Uh, people shifted to corn syrup, Cairo, <laughs> for their pecan pies, which did nothing for low blood. Uh, <laughs> now we have GMO corn syrup. Now that may change. People want real food, and in a big demographic shift, young people want farmland, and they want a sensible life. Making sorghum molasses means intense labor, but it turned out to be a great cash crop. Low supply, good demand. When all the stalks of the sorghum came, lay in long shreds, which the cattle loved, they would uh, they'd shove and stomp to get the most. <laughs> uh, Bo, walking stiff, bow-legged, carried each of the milk cans over to the fire. He and his daddy dropped the pan into place and sloshed in all the cane juice. Then Mrs. Marshall explained to me <laughs> my next task. <laughs> I'd be stirring and skimming all day till the molasses were done, molasses being a plural in the mountains. She told me how folks had got lazy and left the molasses scorch and then slapped a label on a jar and sold it to travelers who'd never had good and didn't know no better. My back hurt. She showed me how to draw the long-handled stirrer all along the bottom of the pan, seven foot long, um, <laughs> to keep the juice from sticking. The juice grew clearer as copious and unending foam rose and lapped the edges of the pool. The stirrer ended in a kind of shovel that I'd slide along the surface collecting foam before it could settle back and spoil the batch. Hours passed, mm. uh, but only four and a half <laughs> instead of eight, which I had not been apprised of in advance of this event. Eight. Um, so four and a half to everyone's surprise and consternation. When molasses are ready, you move. They have to be lifted off the fire quick before the syrup starts thickening into candy. Ms. Marshall came flurrying out of the house, wiping pie dough off her hands, and took over the stir and told me to run to the spring house, fill a bucket and douse the fire, and get Bo and Nestor. Yes, sir. Uh, I did. Uh, <laughs> and went barreling up the road, yelling, found them patching fence with baling wire. They stopped to watch me approach. Mm. Till they could make sense. <laughs> <laughs> of my gasping and gesturing back toward the big house, they dropped their tools and they took off running. After the syrup cooled, we ladled it into half-gallon mason jars, lots of them, and Miss Marshall and I went havers on the yield. Those molasses were about the best I'd ever put in my mouth, honey brown, tangy, and rich. Now, my Texas granddaddy called sorghum lick, as in, pass me the lick. Uh, <laughs> it would dribble down the pitcher, and, and you'd catch the drip with a finger, and then insert your sticky digit into your mouth. <laughs> you may recall the dinner table scene in the film To Kill a Mockingbird. When the children's little freckled schoolmate, a, a poor boy in the Great Depression, asks if there's molasses, he proceeds to pour a pitcher full all over his meal like gravy. 
and the tomboy daughter embarrasses him about it. Now, hospitality was and is a big deal in the South. The housekeeper, Calpurnia, hauls that girl into the kitchen <laughs> and hisses at her. He is your guest. If he wants to... <laughs> the little boy was poor and sorghum. Next morning at dawn, and every morning till the stalks were all cut, or frost got them. It was the first time I ever prayed for frost in my life. <laughs> <laughs> we started the process again. Each morning I lay in bed considering the state of my body. I thought about stoop labor in cane fields and lumps of sugar at high tea. I thought about picking cotton, about one-room teetery sharecropper shacks in the deep south. I thought about slavery. And then I reminded myself that I'd signed on for this one <laughs> and heaved all my muscle groups out of bed. Each bash of molasses came off as fast as the first. Ms. Marshall and I wondered about it, sitting in her kitchen, waiting for buttermilk biscuits to come out of the wood cook stove. She had been making sorghum nigh on 70 years and had watched the shift from horse on manure spreaders to big tractors slinging out 10-10-10 fertilizer, a white powder derived from petroleum. Well, it made the oil companies rich, but, but what about the land? What is it you done different? What is it, honey? Seed's what I give you from the last loop planted. And he'd spread 10, 10, 10, same as always. Since how long, Ms. Marshall? Oh, let's see now. It would be right about after the war that them county agents told everybody to use chemical fertilizer. Said crops would green up good and yields would go up. They did do for a while. Used DDT back then, too, but we don't do that anymore. Ms. Marshall, the cane field didn't get 10, 10, 10. You remember me hauling loads of manure out of the barn in the big wheeled cart? This was before I had a tractor. Well, uh, besides that, <laughs> the field got rock dust up from the granite quarry on a spreader truck. And now, don't laugh. I spread, I spread ground seaweed too. Seaweed? Oh, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> kelp they call it. It's still used some as fertilizer along the coasts of Scotland and Ireland and it's supposed to grow awful good taste in potatoes. Coming full circle, the wild Blue Ridge and Smoky Mountains had been early settled by Highland Scots and poor Crofter Irish, driven off their lands by the expletive deleted Brits. <laughs> so, it seemed like it might be a good idea, a way to start building up the land. I thought I'd give it a try on the cane field and the garden and the orchard, all three. Mm -hmm. um, kelp's kind of like the salt lick we give cattle now in the brown mineral block for trace minerals they don't get from our soil anymore since the shift to 10, 10, 10. And you know, it hadn't occurred to me when I spread all that stuff, but they do say trace minerals can increase not just flavor, but sugar content. Maybe that's why the juice keeps thickening up so, so much sooner than usual. <coughs> but Ms. Marshall, if I'd known last spring what I know now. I narrowed my eyes at her, and she started to get tickled. I might not have planted as many seed. It's the longest fast work I've ever done. <laughs>
between the garden and the road still leaned every which way. I had frenzied adventures, driving out cattle, sheep, horses, goats, and pigs. They'd escape their own enclosures and come rambling down the road. If Eula, my neighbor, saw critters in the garden before I did, she would get on the phone, there's hogs in your ever-bearing strawberries. <laughs> Quick as can be, I'd drop the jelly spoon, pull the jam pot off the fire, barrel around the side of the house, grabbing up a stick to look more formidable to hogs that were nearly as long as I was tall. <laughs> The oikers lived up on what used to be Ms. Marshall's high field. And being clean animals by nature, most people don't know that, um, they like to come snorting down the road on their stubby legs to wallow in the trout stream. I looked up from supper one evening to see hogs at the kitchen window that was level with the ground. Pigs. Pig eyes considered my soup and cornbread. Their snouts were printing the window glass. <coughs> that year I went on almost daily pig walks. And there were days when it wasn't easy to love a hog. <laughs> <laughs> now, goats also got out. <laughs> chomping all the buds off the damask roses, girdling young fruit trees, and pooping on the porch. I liked really fresh goat's milk and happily recalled Toggenberg goat bells ringing many-toned on meadows of Edelweiss and forget-me-not in the Alps. Real life with goats was another matter. The day a goat slammed me into the milking shed wall, images of Heidi bit the dust. <laughs> Eventually, a friend helped me string the electric fence with a solar charger. Goats, <coughs> rocky acrobats that they are, leap most anything else. After that, animals out loose on meanders respected the edge of the garden. Thereafter, my only interruptions in the big garden were human. <laughs> Not many folks passed on a dirt road in a day, maybe three vehicles including tractors, uh, <laughs> and seven on a busy day. But in the country, people stopped to look and talk. What you doing? Making a raised bed? A what? <laughs> so I'd sit in the dirt and talk and learn what worked for them and, and their granddaddy. One man who stopped to talk Lord, I missed the farm. One man who stopped to talk stayed to teach me how to make sheaves of the buckwheat, which I'd intended to green manure after the honeybees finished their euphoria in the blossoms. But it got away from me uh, and had set seed. I didn't have a hand thresher, so I thought to cut it for the chickens that year. Uh, the man and I got into the rhythm of talking and bending and gathering up the grain with a twist of stalk till the whole plot was standing sheaves. It had to be furious haste before people drove by the front porch of an evening and didn't slow down to at least say, hey. More likely, I'd get the day's news and questions about mine. Here you're expecting company. Yep. <laughs> I sat shelling out a half bushel of red speckled beans. Smells like you've been making bread. Uh, you make many loaves. Five. Figuring on a big crowd, they asked. And I asked them in turn. Because comings and goings of people moved like garlands weaving shadow strands past to friends married and babies born and parents buried in the future. Come on.
pull that sugar and set the spell.